This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. This episode is brought to you by Clavio, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Clavio, you can activate all your customer data in real time, connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels, guide your marketing strategy with AI powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance, deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale, and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Clavio. Learn more at Clavio.com slash Spotify. That's K L A V I Y O.com slash Spotify. Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Michael T about what to do when your leaders struggle to perform. Michael Teep, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Connecticut. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about what to do when your leaders struggle to perform. Uh, we talk a lot about leadership on this show. We talk a lot about what to do with team members who aren't performing, but we haven't talked a lot about what to do with those who are leading who aren't performing. And this is a really important question. And frankly, I think a lot of organizations are struggling with it. Um, it just, you know, there there are layers of leadership. And so there's always, you always are accountable to somebody. Um, even if you're the CEO, usually there's a board you're accountable to. And all the way down the hierarchy, there's always people you're accountable to. And sometimes um, leaders just aren't doing what they need to be doing. And that can be a difficult, challenging conversation to have. So we're going to unpack that and explore that together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Michael's bio with everybody. Michael Teep, since 1994, has been conducting business and personal effectiveness design and delivering training, coaching, and train the trainer programming, also training strategy development for a wide spectrum of clients. He works for global corporations, leading training firms and universities, as well as small and mid-market businesses. Mike has obtained unique and relevant market experience in helping companies achieve their goals. Training globally provided him with a rich understanding of cultural differences, as well as global experience in train the trainer skills. Uh, great background. Anything you would like to share with me or my audience by way of your background or personal context before we dive on into the broader conversation? Well, thanks, John. Yeah, um, I'm really your people development partner. So what I love to do, and particularly in the leadership space, is to come into organizations. What's the challenge or what's the journey you're on and make positive difference? So that could be anything, any training solution, uh, coaching bringing your sea level together, all those wonderful things. So it's a great, it's it's nice to be able to contribute like that uh, throughout organizations. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fun space to be in. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a high impact kind of a career. Uh, I always think because you're not only impacting, you know, if you're coaching that individual, you're coaching, usually they have influence and they, they are responsible for teams, um, and so there's ripple effects, yeah. or if you're doing training or certainly train the trainer where they're, you're training people, how to train people, um, there, there's all these ripple effects. And I think there's a high potential for strong, positive impact within organizations through the type of work that you do. So I appreciate that. And like I mentioned in the intro, 
uh, I think most organizations need more of this. And it's it's a hard thing because when budgets are tight and the economy is not in a great in great shape, mm. this kind of stuff is often some of the first things that companies get rid of um to 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 cut back on budget but man it's it's probably when they need it the most it is yeah um it's not seen as an investment unless the leadership gets it already do you know mm-hmm. what i mean they've already been exposed to what it can do to just to have your leadership team or leaders or your people talk about culture in the right way uh, and that's highly interactive their thought process and bringing them, connecting them with what they need to do. You know, where am I, mm-hmm. where's the organization going? How do they contribute? Because people, unless they understand their purpose and find their place, they're mm-hmm. lost at best, uh, complain in the middle and leave at worst. Yeah. So, you know, it's, and, I, and I've actually found that people tend to engage with me, uh, those that have the vision and, and want to help their teams grow. But I've, usually i start with oh there's a there's a need we need to revamp our our values ethos purpose structure we we have this leadership program we want to run globally and once they see it then it's like ah oh, it's a light bulb oh okay i can see how this could be useful so yeah that's that's how i like to work with very organically with organizations yeah. i'm not selling one product and and nor should anyone it should be about what's needed right and in a leadership space it, all the situations are slightly different, but there are certain yep. techniques we can use to help people connect to it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And before we really dive on into the topic, I want to double click on that for a minute because that's really, hmm. really important. <laughs> you know, you, you see, I think, unfortunately, too often you see these off the shelf solutions that are presented, hmm. you know, from consultants or agencies to organizations and the problem is no two situations are exactly alike. Every context is a little bit different. So even if, you know, I'm doing a, a train the trainer, you know, at X, X company, yeah. you know, in a particular industry, a particular size, you know, a particular makeup, and then I move on and do a train the trainer in a in Y company, very similar demographics, same industry, yeah. you know, same size. It could seem easy to think, oh, this is just an off the shelf solution, no customization needed, and and everything's going to be great. Um, in my experience, though, there are always nuances. There's always contextual differences, and you always have to make adjustments. And if you don't, um, you may not actually be tackling the real problem at hand you might be addressing surface level issues but you're probably not getting at the root causes of of the challenges that organizations are facing yeah you know you're actually adding to if leaders are already struggling you're adding to their problems by Mm -hmm. getting them to do more administration run out a global program turn up you know do a a speech at the beginning then they've got to do all these one-to-ones afterwards and did that really solve the problem so it's a double-edged sword isn't it yeah john you know you need you need some consistency so people understand the main themes and and what it is if you can pull the models that are best practice over time which is i love to do that pull a model and then you apply it to the real situation Mm -hmm. that's where the gold is yeah yeah so i don't i don't like to do off the shelf um but what i do is something i can do something in mid-range well i'm I'm not going to recreate the wheel there's a best practice for yeah a coaching model is a coaching model so if, if you've got leaders who are struggling with coaching, actually talking and asking questions and are more authoritarian, you know, tell, then I will pick that and then apply it. How does this work for you? Um, how can you bring it to life? But I don't want to change the person into robots. You know, I don't want leaders or they all follow the exact same process over and over again for how they communicate with their employees. It's just, like you said, it's uh, it's very vanilla and you don't achieve the what we want what do we want from people right we want them to be proactive we want them to connect to purpose and give us their full focus and energy when they're at work they're not going to do that if you're say do this do that you know yeah. when a leader yeah. when a um, leader says a uh, jump we don't want everyone to say well how high would you like me to jump <laughs> it just doesn't work yeah exactly exactly and unfortunately that's a too common um kind of mindset i think uh, for a lot of yeah. leaders and for a lot of organizations. Anyways, I just wanted to briefly emphasize that. I, I really appreciate, um, you know, you're articulating the need uh, for some form of customization and making sure that 
what we're doing actually fits the the context that we're in and is applicable within a particular set of circumstances because that's really important. Okay, now let's drill in and I want to talk again more about what do you do with leaders who aren't performing? And to start off this conversation, I wanted to share an anecdote. So uh, this was a few years back in, in Utah. Um, we have what's called Silicon Slopes. It's a pretty vibrant tech scene. Uh, we call it Silicon Slopes uh, because there's mountains, you know, and we're in a valley and and it's, it's very vibrant akin to Silicon Valley. So that's what it's kind of been termed. Um, and there was a major tech company that I was doing some work with. Um, you know, global tech firm that's, that's headquartered and, uh, they, they were dealing with a challenge and, and really after, uh, trying to understand what was happening, they were losing a lot of good people, lots of turnover, like Hmm. in one division, uh, a disproportionate number of people leaving good people, people with good performance. Um, and as we drilled into it more and more, what we found was there's this one key kind of mid range executive over that division um, who was incredibly problematic <laughs> and right. it went on for like two or three years and they just mm-hmm. kept on losing good people, losing good people, problem spreading, problem spreading. And it it really took two or three years before this was something that the organization was ready to tackle. And, you know, I, certainly this is something I had thought about before that point in time, but that just hit it home to me so clearly how much good positive influence a good leader can have. Uh, over teams of people, but also the disruption they can cause mm. and the harm they can cause if you have someone in a leadership position who is not performing, not doing the things they're supposed to be doing, and in, in some ways actually causing harm and, and actually hurting the teams, hurting the organizations, and certainly the individuals who end up choosing to leave to get out of that environment. Um, so I suspect when we all sit back and reflect, we've probably all experienced some level of that in our working life. Um, where you've seen less effective um, hmm. leaders uh, who who may, you know, despite whatever their best intentions might be, maybe they're they're mucking up the works a bit or causing problems or, or you know, just making things more difficult than they need to be. Um, so that that's the question is, I guess, first, like, how do you identify that? So if I'm, you know, in this particular context that I was just describing, this tech firm, you know, this this kind of mid-range executive over a division, you know, he reported to somebody and it was lost on them for like a couple years. So, yeah. so there was a problem there. Like, how do you make sure that you're tuned in and aware of the problems that might be happening from people who report to you, the leaders who report to you? Um, what mechanisms are in place for say employees who might be caught in a bad system in a bad yeah. environment? Uh, and then how can you either make a change or proactively coach and mentor that leader so they can turn things around and actually you know, fulfill their leadership potential so that they can have dynamic teams. That's a lot that I just shared, but I wanted to share that as kind of an intro. Which one of the 15 would you like me to start with, John? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Because so there's let's let's break that apart. Right. There's the there's the leader that should have noticed right we have very privileged positions we come into organizations usually when something needs to be fixed um and in a better position is hey we want to drive something forward but this is where something needs to be fixed and we're we're usually late to the party Mm -hmm. and when we talk to those leaders the ones that were in charge and you know we feel should have noticed or should have been looking for signs throughout this they often say oh well you know it wasn't too bad or the work was, you know, something was good and they let it slide. Like their work was really good. The results were really good. And then they let the communication slide. Yeah. Or it's really, they notice it quicker when they're not getting the results from the division. Does that make sense? So it's very measured and results focused, the brain. Um, And also there's a lot of doubt. You know, a lot of these leaders would say to me, and I'm sure to you, Jonathan, in your work, is that, is that well with hindsight i should have dealt with this earlier so there's mm-hmm. something that they're like hmm and usually if they've heard a grievance or something they tend to need more than one situation in order to feel that they could bring it up let alone do something about it so there's a little bit of caution around don't want to upset anything yet who's right and who's wrong so there's too much doubt in that mindset and and in and that's from a leader's point of view if you're struggling with that, 
is always, well, what are my one-to-ones saying? What what is the what is the culture that I want all my leaders? How do I want them to communicate with their people? Um, you know, when they bring up ideas, are they judged and pushed to one side? That's one of the biggest ones. How does a how does um, a manager receive effective challenge from their employees? It's a big mm-hmm. sign. Um, so there are key moments in communication. But what they're not doing is thinking about, well, okay, oh, I've got do I deal with this situation? Could I make it worse? They're in a, yeah. an away state. They're like, it's my job to make sure that this area works well. And I, I can see something here. I'm not quite sure what it is. So I, the caution is I won't do anything until it becomes serious. So that's the human mindset mm-hmm. um, when it comes to you running. a. Uh, that's what I've found when we find yeah, running a yeah. division. What we need is someone in a curious state. Oh, that's interesting. Well, perhaps I should have a good conversation with this leader. Hey, you know, what happened here? How's it going with the communication? And then you need to set up your organization, as you mentioned. You need um, ways to see this yourself, the feedback loop. Are there skip level meetings? in your organization do the are the teams allowed time without their manager to express it and we see those mechanisms in you know the employee survey for example everyone's filled in one of those um and you're like ah nothing's going to happen on this no, it's anonymous but really it is batched into areas and they do take it serious it's At difficult to see trends right? well yeah <laughs> that's, that's, Let's just say that, they, you know, they're like, oh, so that's, um, for example, I'm doing some work on how managers receive effective challenge. So it's top of mind at the moment. It's a big project uh, across a, a, a large financial institute out of New York. And their employee survey really showed that I don't think my manager's supportive. And I'm like, hmm, OK. And it wasn't that much. It was still OK, but it mm-hmm. had dropped. So mm-hmm. they scratched that itch and, and they went back and they were like, OK, well, let's interview a few people. Let's be curious about it. We don't know what the problem is yet. We don't know how to solve it yet, but we can ask some questions and are asking that general area. And they found that they felt they were being dismissed. Whenever they brought up an idea, it was either we've tried that. It doesn't work. We haven't got time for that. We need to drive ahead. And mm-hmm. you can understand those pressures. Every leader knows that pressure. It's like, we've got to get this done, pressure, pressure. But it was affecting how, and people were leaving. People were saying, well, you know, there was an uptick in, in um, of people leaving the, the company and exit interviews are another great indicator. So you need some way to get the feedback in. You can do it formally. I personally prefer the, the level up meetings, the coffees and asking really good questions. Yeah, really good questions. Um, and those questions have to be exploratory as to around the environment. Um, and you can use some of the employee survey questions as well to do that. That mm-hmm. gives you a barometer. And then you compare that with your manager. You, go, you have to have conversations with them. Um, and I find that saying things like my expectations of you as my manager is to be open, to be uh, inclusive of ideas. And 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 you, you can actually give them examples where you've seen that hasn't worked. So that's where I would start because it doesn't cost a lot of money. Mm-hmm. All it does is we're changing from being defensive to a future state, curious. I wonder what's going on here. And having a little scratch around without feeling like I don't know the answers, being very open about it, um, which is not what we feel we're paid for as leaders, is it? So, yeah. Yeah. I, I was having a conversation yesterday with kind of a mid-range executive um and and this individual was facing the common challenge that i think a lot of leaders face where they just felt felt like they're spending the vast majority of their time putting out fires constantly um yeah. every day it was just putting out new fires uh and so we had a nice conversation around like strategies um that he could employ to start being forward looking and proactive and setting a, up a context um creating an environment um, where he can understand what's happening, be curious. And, and in that proactive sense, like you, you create an environment where you're actually 
undercutting the fires before they ever happen. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it takes time. It takes extra energy. And, and sometimes you don't feel like you even have that time to invest, but if you can start to carve out the time to do that, even in small chunks, then little by little, you can start to see the fires reduce a little bit. That frees up some more time that now you can invest more time into it. And there are always going to be some fires that's inevitable. But if you feel like, you're dealing with fires all day, every day, and that's all you're doing. And you're constantly in crisis mode. If that's how every day is every week, every month, then I think that says more about your leadership style and your approach in, of engaging with your people and the type of communication that you're having, than it does about the actual nature of, you know, the, the, the circumstances that are arising and the fires that you're having to deal with. Um, nobody mm. should have to deal with constant fires every day. And uh, even in challenging times, there there should still be a mix of like forward thinking strategy and visioning and those sorts of things, creating the culture, sustaining the culture mixed with the nitty gritty of the day to day things that need to get done, addressing yeah. the problems that arise, etc. And I don't know if you've experienced that, but it just seems like so many leaders get caught up in the grind and just end up spending all their time putting out fires. And ultimately, that isn't going to get you to a place of high performance, high productivity and, and, and innovation, you know, so yeah. you can do cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm working right now with a couple of CFOs, the COOs, and I'm tended to find that I've noticed since COVID, because that's, that's when we overloaded on crisis. They're all running around dealing with crisis. They're not strategically thinking. And I'm like, you have all this experience, you know how yeah. to do this. Yeah. And, and, I was having a conversation with a, a CFO just this week and she was telling me that, well, actually, Mike, you know, I like, I like a crisis. My mind works like that. And I said, no, I think you've been, you've got used to it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and people are, you're getting praise for putting out the fires. So you're not concentrating. Why does every conversation have to be a, an urgent one around crisis and deadlines? Yeah. You know, to me, a crisis is not something that needs to be, if it's not needs to be done this week, it's not a crisis. It's it's a bit like CNN. Sorry, CNN, but not everything can be breaking news. <laughs> right. <laughs> Remember when the there was an aeroplane, one of the Malaysian aeroplanes, a terrible incident, but it was like breaking news for days while they were trying to work out. And I was sitting there going, I, at some point, I need to calm down and think about my work. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's, it's the, it's the breaking news concept is just... Just what is the one priority you need to focus on? Let's get back to being strategic about it, right? Um, and you, you hit on something that I think it, yeah, you hit on something that I think is really important. Mm. It's the dopamine hit that you get from putting out a crisis yeah. and people praising you. <laughs> like yeah. you really can get into that pattern and the habit of just thinking this is the way I function. This is the best way, and I, I'm you know I'm I'm getting things done. I'm I'm solving crises, um, but but it's not the most effective way. Uh, to go about leading a team. And I, I've also noticed, I've seen some leaders who, you know, have taken a bit of a political hit because they they put so much time and energy into creating the environment, the culture, mm -hmm. doing the, the legwork behind the relationships and building the trust and all that stuff that then creates a humming, you know, fine-tuned machine, you know, the, the humming team that mm -hmm. just moves along. And then, you know, it can, in certain circumstances, you can take a bit of a political hit as a leader because now people are are looking at you and they're like, what do you do all day? I don't see you putting out fires all day like I put out <laughs> fires all day. And, you know, I've seen those types of dynamics arise from time to time. And and then I ask myself the question, why? 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 Do, what is it about like society that makes us think that the ideal wow. is putting out fires all day? And there's a lot we could unpack there. But you just hit one example of like the breaking news in, mm. in, uh, in the news. Um, I think of like, a popular show, Suits. Have you ever seen that show? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Suits <laughs> is an example. If anyone's seen that show, it's popular, right? Lots of people have seen it. Um, everything is a crisis in that show. Every last episode, there's like major mm -hmm. crises every minute of every hour of every day. And that's not how the... That's not how a real organization should work. Uh, and so anyways, people see that and then they start to idolize it. And they see, oh, a great leader is someone who can you know, put out those fires constantly. And I think that gets reinforced in organizations. It's not a healthy mindset to have in how we approach our leadership. No, they're being disrupted. 
Mm -hmm. This is the thing. Uh, they're being disrupted from doing the work they're paid to do. And, mm -hmm. and, then, and then they're feeding off of that. You get the dopamine release. So when, when do leaders struggle? They struggle when they get disrupted. Yeah. And they, they often lose sight of the overall arching goal or the problem and work on that and work on the, you know, um, they work on the crisis at hand, fixing little things. Really, you've got a team to do that. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and also how you deal with the team and asking them to think about their crises as making things better mm -hmm. rather than you have to get this fixed because we're, you know, we clients are waiting for it, blah, blah, blah. Let's make this better. Let's do this the right way, the first way. So let's take some time. So actually what you're doing is like a pendulum swing from overreacting right through to underreacting. Oh, well, I'll ignore that crisis. It's not important. That's what people do. They mm -hmm. like, well, these crises aren't important, but these are. We're going to work on this. But we want the pendulum to swing into the middle and get adaptive yes. calm so people can scenario plan. You know, it's, it's actually part of psychological safety when it comes to mm -hmm. your, the culture. Do you have an area where people can look above the parapet and, and think, oh, that's interesting. What's going on here? And that's where we get the better results and longer lasting. If we don't have direction and North Star, um, oh, you know, is, is it safe to fail? all of those things when you become disrupted you're struggling it's when those things are less so we have to spend around spend time actually more time not talking about the problem but talking about how are we communicating uh, going back to your culture point uh, you know become become the driver the forward momentum towards the north star rather than get crisis and i you know that's that's where a lot of leaders struggle um yeah. And that's just one area, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Michael, I know at the time, I need to let you go here in just a minute. We've only scratched the surface. There's so much more we could dive into <laughs> on this topic and related topics, um, but we're going to have to leave it there today. Before I let you go, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Great. Thank you, John. Um, Michael Teep, you'll find us, our website is teeptraining.com. If you Google TEEP, T-E-A-P-E, -E, it's the first thing that comes up. I can't even avoid you even if I tried. So I'm there. <laughs> I'm the best way to get in contact with me is LinkedIn or send us an email from there. And let's talk about your, your challenges. Your What's your people development challenges? Love to find out, um, give some hints and tips from what our work over the years. Uh, you never know. It might be helpful. So that's where I'm with that. And my final thought on on leaders as they're struggling is that they're human beings so it really helps to give them maybe an independent person or allowing them to look above their day-to-day -day, filling out the reports and the crisis is that let's just take a moment yeah let's look where we've been let's look let's just see that see the forest for the trees so if we could provide them that moment and ask them how they're doing but really asking them how they're doing will get more people back on track uh, and feeling good about that and less stress as well. So that's my thought on that, John. Well said, Michael. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I encourage Thank the you. audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Michael and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.